We'll go ahead and take your Bibles and we'll turn to the book of Matthew. And um, it's the first book of the New Testament. And um, the book of Matthew, we're still, we're, we're still in chapter 1. So last week, uh, as we've begun our study in the book of Matthew, we learned through the preserved genealogy of Jesus that he fulfills those genealogy prophecies, right? Uh, we learned that, and we learned that, um, that even though uh, many, if not all Jews, lost their genealogies when the temple was burned in A.D. 70, was destroyed by the, the Romans, Jesus' genealogy is preserved here uh, in the New Testament in the book of Matthew. And we also see it in the book of Luke. But uh, we're studying the book of Matthew, so that's the one that we've, we've looked at. And, um, and that we, we learned last week that he does come from the line of Abraham and the line of David, just as God has promised. Right? And, uh, and we went and we saw the, the links that God went to to do that, right? So not only did he cover those lines through the father, through Joseph, what we read in Matthew, but we know that Luke... Uh, gives another genealogy, the genealogy of Mary, and that is covered in Mary's genealogy as well. So the house of David is on both sides, through the, through the father and the mother. And so we also talked about the, the people in Jesus' genealogy that were people of what we would consider unsavory character, right? But we better not consider not not consider that we are just like them, <laughs> right? Does that, does that make sense? Is that double negative, triple negative, whatever that was, right? Did you get it? <laughs> we are just like them. We are unsavory characters, right? And, uh, and so through, uh, uh, and that's whom Jesus came to save. And uh, through all of that, we saw how God is true to his word and that he will accomplish his purposes. I would really like us to say that out loud. There's something about saying a statement out loud that makes it more true for us, okay? So would you guys say that statement with me that, that um, God will accomplish his purpose? Say it with me. God will accomplish his purposes, right? He will. And, um, and that's true. So I don't know where you find yourself today, like what circumstances or what situation or what's going on in your life. Just know this, no matter what that looks like, no matter what the world looks like, no matter what it looks like overseas, no matter what, God will accomplish his purposes. And as his people, we've got to find some joy in that, right? That should excite us. And we can't let all this stuff be dragging us down all the time. We have to know that no matter what, no matter what we are facing, God will accomplish his purposes. And so we're going to continue to see that. And see this take place as we get into the birth of Jesus today. And the things that could have thwarted God's purposes but wouldn't because why? God what? Man, come on, guys. God will accomplish his purposes. Amen. All right. Good job. So verse 18 is what we're going to be picking up today uh, in Matthew, and this is what it says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Do you believe that? Yes. Well, why? Oh, okay, good, awesome, because the Bible says. And so uh, we can be assured that what Matthew was writing, that now the birth of Jesus took place this way, we can be sure that it took place this way, this way. And, um, and it goes on to say, verse 18, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, you and I need a little bit of background to fully understand what's going on. So we're going to get a, some of that today, okay? You guys okay with that? You ready for a little bit of, of background? So um, the custom of betrothal is different from what you and I call engagement. It's different um, what engagement is in modern society. <coughs> Excuse me. Customarily... The parents of a young man chose a young woman to be engaged to their son. All right, that's what would take place. And there would be a second stage of the betrothal involving uh, official arrangements and a prenuptial agreement uh, before witnesses. 
um, which was legally, which was a legally binding con uh, contract, okay, and could only be broken by a formal divorce. So this would e this would take place in what in an hour time frame the engagement period, but this is different. <laughs> you know, you guys understand this is a betrothal. This is a this is for real. You think they were serious about this? Yeah. Absolutely, they were. And, uh, and so what we have here in verse 18 is that we have Joseph and Mary. They were in their second stage of their betrothal. Like all the arrangements had been made, the agreements and all this. And Joseph had been working hard to meet those agreements and to provide all the things that he was supposed to provide. And so you guys understand where they are in their relationship. This is where, this is where they are. And the only way to get out of that stage of the relationship is through a divorce. All right? So a little bit different than, than what we have in our arrangements. <coughs> now Matthew writes, sorry, <coughs> Matthew writes here, before they came together. Do I need to explain this any further? Everybody understand what that means? They were, again, they were in the betrothal stage of their relationship. The two don't become one flesh until marriage. Okay, so we got it? Yeah. So they were doing things the, the godly way, right? The godly way, the right way, the honorable way. The one that God, the way that God says, hey, I want you to do it like this because I love you way. Right? That's what it's about. But there's a problem that, that arises. So they're in this betrothal stage. We know that the two haven't become one flesh. But yet Mary is found to be with child. Mary was beginning to show. Uh-oh, Nazareth. We have a problem. Right? <laughs> we have a problem. Well, at least it, this is a problem for Joseph because he doesn't know that she is with child because of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to make something clear here. If, if you guys would just give me a second. I just, I wrote this down and I feel like it needs to be said for whatever reason today. God did not have sexual relationships with Mary. He did not. God did not have sex with Mary. Okay. There are those out there that are considered under the Christian umbrella that would teach that. And I will tell you that anyone who would teach that is teaching heresy and it is a false religion. An easy way to determine false religions is that false religions will humanize God and deify man. Anything calling themselves a church or religion who does this is false, and you should separate yourselves from those things. Amen. Back to the story. <laughs> Joseph doesn't know the cause of Mary's pregnancy, that the cause of Mary's pregnancy is the Holy Spirit, and so his only conclusion that he can come up with is what? She, she committed adultery. Like, that, that's the only possible human reason that I can come up with. And so verse 19 says, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Because they were in that second stage of betrothal that the only way to get out was what? Divorce. You were also called husband and wife, even though you weren't living in the same house, and even though you haven't two haven't become one flesh in this stage of betrothal. Talking about commitment, right? right. <laughs> Can y'all see where our society lacks commitment? Yes. Yeah, we do. Can you see where our like our society has things backwards? We want to test drive things before we buy. Uh uh. That's not the way of God. And we wonder why our world is in such trouble. So again, betrothal partners were referred to as husband and wife. And though, again, though they were not considered to be married and doing marital, married things, if they were doing marital, married things in this time of betrothal, 
It will be considered immoral. It would be against God. And we know from this verse, Matthew tells us a little bit about Joseph. We don't know a whole lot about Joseph, but here we get a, a picture of Joseph. He's a what kind of man? He's a just man. And Matthew's telling us that Joseph is an upright man who obeys the law of Moses. He knows what God's word says and he does it, is what Matthew is telling us about him. And you guys know that, again, so sexual unfaithfulness during betrothal was considered adultery. And under the Mosaic law, could carry the death penalty. And we even know this from the, from the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. You remember Jesus came? And they were about to kill her. Literally, they were going to stone her to death. And Jesus, you remember Jesus said? What did he say? You who was without sin cast the first stone. Right? So it was a legal thing to do. Under the Mosaic law. And so Joseph, Joseph is a just man who does that. But, but it says this statement. He resolved. So he made the decision to divorce her quietly. So Joseph intended here to maintain his personal righteousness. Yet he desired to show compassion even though Mary appeared to be an adulteress. One of my commentaries said this about Joseph. Joseph becomes something of a model of one whose high standards are balanced with compassion. Isn't this how we should be as a church? Amen. How you and I should be people of high standards who are full of compassion. It sounds a lot like Jesus. Jesus. Verse 20 goes on to say, but as he considered these things, as he considered what? Divorcing Mary, right? So as he considered these things, behold. So that's just a statement of listen up, <laughs> right? Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so now Joseph knows. Now, because it was communicated to him uh, from God through an angel in a dream, right? He knows that she did not commit adultery. But I'm asking you, does he believe it? Does he believe it? And how do we know if he believes it? And this is, this is how we know because we know this statement. What, what you believe is demonstrated by what you do, right? It's not by... What you say or what you, th what are you doing? That determines what you really uh, believe and we will see later on. And then the angel continues in verse 21. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. In the Jewish culture, the father was responsible for naming his son at the time of his circumcision, which is in Jewish culture, we know it's eight days after his birth it would take place. And that's when the, the father would name the child. And so when the angel commands Joseph to call his son Jesus, he is also commanding Joseph to accept his role as father of this child. It is also important to note that names were often thought to represent the character or calling of the individual. I find this a little bit ironic as my mom sent me a text message just this week telling me what my name means, what Stephen means. It means a crown. I don't know if that was a bald joke or not, but <laughs> that was one of the meanings of Stephen. But names, again, were thought to represent the character or calling of individuals. And we see this play out often throughout the Bible. There are many people. And it was definitely the case with Jesus. I just want to look at the name of Jesus real quick. So Jesus' name in, in Hebrew is Yeshua. Or Yeshua, sorry. 
Yeshua, it's important where you put the accent. Yeshua. And the meaning of Yeshua means this. It means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. That's, a, that's what the meaning of the, the name. And wanted to point out here that, and you guys know this from, if you're taking Jesse's class where you talk a lot about Hebrew, the letters that spell Yahweh are this, yud Hey vav Hey. yud Hey vav Hey. And those letters have pictures. They're not, it's because the Hebrew is a pictorial language. And so the pictures of, of that uh, yud Hey vav Hey stand for this. It stands for behold the hand, behold the nail. And so Jesus' uh, name is literally is saying, Behold the hand, behold the nail, saves. That's what his name means. Do you think that that was accurate to his character and calling? Absolutely it was. He saves his people. He saves his people. And he doesn't save them from the tyrannical reign of the Roman Empire. Right? But something that is far more and has far more eternal consequences. He saves them and us from our sins. That's what he does. I titled this sermon, What's in a Name? Because I felt like that was one of the most important things going on in this passage. So uh, Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is who he is, and this is what he does. You see, all the problems in this world can be traced back to sin. Do you guys agree? Amen. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard to disagree with that. All the problems in this world can be traced back uh, to sin. And the Son of David, the Son of God, came to save you and I from our sins because we couldn't save ourselves. Amen. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we. How many? All. all. That's so important. All. Who does, again, who does that exclude? No one. So all what we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 3, 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by this grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Look, we couldn't save ourselves. And he came. Jesus came. Yahweh saves came to save us from our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we we might become the righteousness of God. In Tony Evans' commentary on the book of Matthew, he writes this about this section of Scripture. He says, Christ Jesus entered the world to identify our sins, forgive us for our sins, give us victory over our sins, and give us an eternal home free from sin. That truth is what Christmas is all about. And if you miss that, you've missed the point. Verses 22 and 23. Matthew, again, this is, this is his thing. This is what he does. Is, is that he wants to make sure, especially for the Jews, he wants to make sure the people reading his letter, that they understand that Jesus is the Messiah and all the prophecies that he fulfilled. 
He wants them to know. He's showing them. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. And this is what he does. This is all this. In verse 22, all of this. How many of that that we just read? All of it took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And he's quoting Isaiah 7, 14 here when he says, Behold the virgin. <laughs> Again, she's pure, right? Behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, the, the name of Jesus is a title signifying the character and the mission of Jesus as God with his people to save them from their sins. And it is not just that God is present in Jesus to help his people. That's very, that's very crucial. It's very crucial to the gospel message. It's very crucial to believe in order to be saved. As you have to believe that. You can't believe that the power of God was just in Jesus. You have to believe that Jesus was God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He is God with us. The prophecy in Isaiah implies that people whom Jesus saves from their sins will call him Emmanuel, God with us. In Matthew chapter 16, which we'll get to a long time from now, so I can, I can, I can quote it today. It's going to be a while before we get there. But in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16, he says this. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are God with us. This is a question that we are all being asked this morning. Jesus is asking you. Now, I've read who he is in the book of Matthew. We've gone through it. I've told you. I've, I've broken down the names. But I promise you this morning, as we've gone through this, you and I are being asked this question. Who do you say that I am? And what's in his name? Who do you say that I am? Warren Wiersbe, and in, in again in his commentary on this, he says Jesus is his human name. Christ is his official title, and Emmanuel describes who he is. God with us. Jesus is God. Now, I said something about Joseph earlier, that he was a just man and he followed the laws of Moses. And I, and I asked the question, like, now that, now that he knows that the child was Conceived by the Holy Spirit, does he believe it? And what did we just we talk about? We we will know if he believed it or not by what he does. And so when, when you and I are being asked by Christ this morning, who do you say that I am? And we give the answer. Do our actions show that we truly believe in that? That you are God, Jesus. You are God. Uh -oh. That's what we'll be able to tell. Is that our, our actions, like what, what we do, determines whether we truly believe that or not. 
So again, ask yourselves the same question. When Jesus says, who do you say that I am? If we, if we were to be answering that with our lives, some of us would say, oh, he was a good person. He was a good prophet. He was someone to model. He did a lot of good things. But is he God? Verse 24 and 25 here of Matthew chapter 1. <coughs> says here, when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. You see, Joseph... I mean, really, how, how, hard, how hard would it for him to, be, to believe this? How hard would that have been to believe this? Like, I think it would have taken more than one dream for me. <laughs> Just letting you know right now. Like, yeah, I don't know. Joseph did believe and his actions showed it and he gets up and he does exactly what he is told without hesitation or question. I wonder how many times you and I get caught up with that. Like God tells us to do something and we don't do it because we're hesitating and we're questioning. And then we're, and then we're unproductive, right? We're not doing anything. We're sitting around. We're, we're on the sidelines. We're not in the game. We're all in. We're in. And then we get distracted and all these other things happen. Again, I know we don't, have, we don't know a whole lot about Joseph, but man, what an example he's being to us in these passages here about trusting God and doing what he says without hesitation or question. And the last part of verse 25, it says this, and he called his name Jesus. Why did he call his name Jesus? Because he was told to call his name Jesus. He was told to. Because it had meaning. It had purpose. It showed who Jesus was. It showed his character. So the question is, is that do you call him Jesus? Jesus. And not just the pronunciation of the name, right? When I mean, we could all look at these letters and say it, say the name of Jesus. But do you call him Jesus for the meaning behind the name? Is the meaning of the name Jesus true in your life? Acts 4.12 says this. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. <laughs> That's where it begins. Is when we... Call him Jesus. Call him God with us. When we call him Jesus, Yahweh saves. When we understand that we can't save ourselves. Has he saved you from your sins? Has he? That's what he came to do. That's great. But has it happened for you? Have you surrendered all of your sins to him so that he can pay for them and save you from them? The message that the prophets taught in the Old Testament, the message that the disciples preached from the moment they began preaching. The message that John the Baptist preached. 
the message that Jesus himself preached was this. Repent now. Repent now. Jesus came to save you from your sins. So are you willing to do that today? Are you willing just to take, take a look at yourself and go this, is, is the name Jesus true in my life? Is the meaning behind his name true for me? So maybe some of us in here have had that, that, uh, that experience that happens, you know, where salvation happens in a moment, but then, you know, it's proven over time, right? But it happens in a moment. And so we've had that moment where we made a decision of some sort to follow Jesus, and we said, okay, Jesus, I, I will do that. This sounds pretty good. You forgive me of my sins. But yet, since that moment, there have been so many other sins that you haven't given him. You know what I mean? There's been so many things. Maybe, maybe right now, if you were to, to look behind the trailer that you're pulling, it's full. It's full of sins that you haven't surrendered to him yet. Are you willing to do that today? In the light of the truth of this passage, the light of the truth of why this is the whole purpose why he came was to do this. Or will you let him this morning? Will you, will you respond to this today? Right now, respond. are open. We have people that will pray with you.